And uh, today's webinar will be delivered by Dr. Laura Ferguson from Queen's University Belfast. And she has been working on the project since, the Harriet project since uh, October 2018. She is a social sciences academic who specializes in natural and cultural heritage, and especially with uh, mapping and stakeholder engagement in the Arctic. She has visited the Arctic and more specifically Svalbard several times, and this is what she would like to talk to you about today. So I think without further ado, I'll pass you over. Great. Welcome, Laura. Thanks, Matt. And as Matt has just told you, um, today I'll be talking about conserving longer beans cultural heritage in a climate of change. And when I'm talking about a climate of change, I'm not just talking about climate change. There have been and, and are a range of socioeconomic changes that have impacted the community and its connection with the past. So I'd like once again to welcome everyone. I understand that we have a very diverse audience. Some are from heritage backgrounds with possibly no knowledge of Svalbard or the Arctic. Uh, others will be from other areas of Arctic studies, but not heritage. Some with a connection to Svalbard, perhaps through scientific research and a broader audience who may not have any professional or personal connection, but just think that it could be a really interesting topic and want to learn more. So I'll, I'll try to pitch the presentation so that hopefully everyone will get something out of the webinar. I'm also aware that we have some residents of Svalbard and I'd like to extend a special warm welcome to you and finally give a special mention to members of the Scottish Arctic Club because the SAC contributed funding towards my field trip to gather data for the Arctic Cultural Heritage Vulnerability Index. First of all, my Arctic background, I first went to the Arctic Nations as an MSc student. Uh, as a science student, it was second time around for me. I already had my PhD, which was in collective memory, community identity and the influences on it. And it wasn't doing very much to me. So I was studying water resources with an interest in extreme cold climate water resources. And when I got to the Arctic, I remember that I was fascinated by the way the reality of what I saw and experienced differed from the representations of the Arctic that I was familiar with from media and tourism marketing and also how the communities had that same close-knit feeling that I remember of the rural communities that I grew up with in Scotland. So naturally, I found myself edging back closer to the more social side of things, and here we are. Um, so previously, working on that side of things, I've worked on Sustainable Heritage Areas Partnerships for Ecotourism, which was a project run by the Centre for Mountain Studies, University of the Highlands and Islands. And then I did this work on industrial cultural heritage and longer being, including the ACHVI. And I've also involved in the Svalbard Social Sciences Initiative, which I'll just tell you a bit about at the end. So the outline of the webinar is that I'll go through cultural heritage in the Arctic and Longer Bean. I'll look at the current status and conservation of cultural heritage. And I'll look at how those heritage is uninherited and how these communities of meaning and communities of participation that we speak of in Pericles um, can tie in with that. I'll then present the key findings of interviews and a survey that I conducted on um, mining heritage in Longer Bean. And then we'll go to the more scientific side of things, looking at the Arctic Culture Heritage Vulnerability Index and asking if it could identify Arctic heritage at risk. And finally, I'll do a few slides on addressing cultural heritage at risk. So cultural heritage in the Arctic, if you're unfamiliar with it, the first thing that might surprise you is that there's rather a lot of it. The Arctic has been inhabited for thousands of years and explored and exploited by outsiders for hundreds of years. Therefore, it's rich in cultural heritage of international, national and local significance. But cultural heritage in Arctic faces many environmental and social threats. It's also often overlooked in the Arctic and um, the focus on natural heritage and the myth of the Arctic wilderness and representations of it. So what we see commonly is this image of the uninhabited Arctic. Um, the cultural construction or a myth as a wilderness, an ecological preserve that consigns human influences to a past vision of hardy explorers, subsistence hunters. It may even eradicate people from the frame altogether. And while the Arctic certainly has a lot of wide open spaces and is sparsely populated in comparison to most places in the world, it is far from pristine. 
It's a peopled place, an industrialised place. There are many modern settlements and these are inhabited by the majority of the almost 4 million people who currently live in the region. But you might be asking, why is heritage important? And when answering this, I always like the way that the Heritage Council phrase it. They say that heritage is a keystone of our culture that plays an important role in our politics, society, business and worldview. Our heritage is our inheritance, what the past has conceded to us, what we value in the present and what we choose to preserve for future generations. I'll now introduce you to Longyearbyen. That's a couple of photos of the town there. They were taken in the late spring, early summer time of year. And it just gives you kind of a feel for the place. And this is where it is. It's located at 78 degrees north in the high Arctic on Svalbard. It was discovered in the late 16th century by a Dutch explorer, William Barents. Now, a key point is in Svalbard, there is no indigenous population. However, it has been exploited by many nations um, from its discovery in the late 16th century for hunting and whaling. And then from the 19th century, coal mining. And this has been, there has been a big change in Longyearbyen in the last 20 to 30 years. It has since evolved into a modern town with many families and other industries. And mining is now minimal and the main activities are tourism, science and education. So that's been a big change there. The town itself has much cultural heritage and this particularly relates to the mining industry. And I'll now be able to show you a few examples of that. This just shows you the different types of heritage that you see around the town. In the top left there, you'll see an example of a mine that's no longer in use. A lot of Longyearbyen's mining heritage is simply decaying structures like this. Next to it is a building built and used for miners. And that building is still in use today, but it's no longer for miners. Top right is a graveyard, and it surprises some people that a lot of Arctic cultural heritage is related to burial sites. Bottom left is a commemorative statue in a of a miner in Longyearbyen town centre. Next to that, the photo was taken in, muse in the museum. There's an excellent museum in Longyearbyen. And those are some mining signposts that they have among their collection of exhibits and interpretive displays on Svalbard's natural and cultural heritage. Finally, that last image was taken in mine three about three years ago now when I visited it. Coal is no longer mined there, it closed in 1996, but the mine is open for guided tours where visitors can get an experience, they can see inside the mine and learn about its history. The conservation that protects Svalbard's cultural heritage is primarily based on legal protection. That's the, the, the main means. And that's covered by the Svalbard Environmental Protection Act, which covers all cultural monuments dating from before 1946 automatically, including all graves, bones, or grave markers, regardless of age. In addition to the cultural heritage itself, there is a 100 meter protection zone in all directions of it. Other methods include adaptive reuse, which is the, the, the use of heritage structures for tourism, perhaps student accommodation, community use, um, as I just mentioned, the museums, and then finally research and monitoring, which is active in the area. Tourism is a very large industry in Svalbard. The Arctic is culturally very alluring, so naturally that's a part of the tourism experience. The cultural heritage is a result of earlier visitors and evidence of the history of Svalbard's development. So we see heritage relating to explorers, scientists, hunters, trappers, and miners. For the tourism industry, the key point is that cultural heritage is a protectable and dependable asset, unlike the wildlife, which might not be there when you are, or even the landscape, which could be shrouded in cloud due to poor weather. The heritage of tourism promoters frames cultural heritage as the remnants of intrepid pioneers in an Arctic landscape. And this cultural heritage reflects tourist aspirations based on preconceived ideas that they have about the Arctic that we mentioned earlier about the, the, the vision of the myth of the Arctic as a wilderness. Tourism narratives have obvious economic value and they stand to be the dominant voice in heritage. However, there is the danger of a disnification of the cultural landscape and the possibility of longer being, being treated by tourists as an open air 
museum. And this can lead to the potential for animosity towards tourism. And I have heard complaints anecdotally of tourists wandering into people's yards and intrusively taking pictures of local life. And that can lead to animosity towards these people. But a counter to this could actually come through local heritage production. And I'm maybe skipping ahead here across the issue that I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides on uninherited heritage. But the town has been inhabited now long enough to have its own authentic community-based heritage. And this could also help in tourism, because if you offer people an alternative experience that will satisfy their appetite for life in Longyearbyen, then they will be less likely to seek it out for themselves in people's backyards or whatever. A self-guided audio, audio tour, for example, could um, be very helpful in that. But as I said, we're going to talk about the issue of um, uninherited heritage, or the matter rather of uninherited heritage. And it's not exclusive to Longyearbyen. It can be applicable anywhere, for example, where people have moved and settled into that space and become connected to the place and its heritage. Longyearbyen is, however, a very strong example of it. It has no indigenous population. The town is very international and has a high population turnover. People are not born on Svalbard and they're legally obliged to leave on becoming old and infirm, so they're not supposed to die there either. There are all transient residents with varying lengths of stay and varying degrees of cultural ties. And something that's not surprising in this situation is that heritage is largely uncontested. However, there is a significant long-term population with very strong place-based connections. And unherited heritage is not a barrier to heritage ownership and conservation within such a community. Sustaining heritage without the typical process of inheritance can be more challenging though. It's without a doubt a more active process and a more conscious choice. They may have to compete with a very strong tourism narrative and there's also typically a greater risk of heritage loss in these situations. But in Longyearbyen, it can follow similar processes to that of local tradition formation because the town actually has a lot of very strong local traditions. Rather than heritage influencing community identity, as is frequently the dominant direction though, in Longyearbyen there would need to be a focus on identity influencing heritage in order to create it via this path. But it could be rooted in the landscape and environment, the spirit of past residents and visitors, and reflective of these local traditions and values that I've just mentioned. And this links to the Pericles concepts that we've been working with across our case regions of communities of meaning and participation. Communities of meaning are shaped by the concepts of space, place and identity. In communities of meaning, heritage is actively used to construct or challenge place narratives and place identities, and as I've mentioned, vice versa. And this heritage is chosen not necessarily based on economic value or professional valuation or the best preserved remains, it's what's relevant to the community at present and to carry forward. It can be enabling and uniting, constructive or dividing, depending on the particular social and political context. And that's something that makes it so interesting. Communities of participation, they form the heritage governance setting. And deliberative and participatory actors define and conceptualize the heritage through these processes of inclusion and exclusion. Now I'm going to come to some research that I conducted in Longer Bean the last time I was up there last year. Um, and some interviews sought the insights of heritage professionals on conservation and development of Arctic industrial heritage. And there's just some key points that I'd like to bring in from that that are really helpful to a discussion of cultural heritage in Longyearbyen. And one of these was that we need a more appropriate and nuanced definition of heritage. They asked specifically, what is heritage and what is junk? And that's a very neat question to answer. The official definition of heritage in Svalbard is, as I've shown, very clear, but it's also very restrictive. I'll just show you a quick example of what this idea of heritage or junk refers to. A lot of heritage in Svalbard is artifacts such as remains of tracks or collapsed wooden structures that in many cases without interpretation could be interpreted or misinterpreted as junk. 
This is what has led some to question whether leaving it in place is necessarily the best course of action, both from an environmental perspective and also from a heritage perspective, as it arguably doesn't do the heritage the greatest justice to be displayed in this way and um, perhaps intervention to preserve by documentation or record and some suitable interpretation methods may serve it better. Another point was that more attention needs to be focused on tan more attention is focused on tangible heritage than intangible heritage and that the intangible heritage needs to be drawn out more and it's a hidden risk to the intangible heritage that could be lost but a new definition of heritage um, this, this could also help address this as well as the heritage and junk question. Third point was that cultural heritage could be better integrated with natural heritage and wider environmental and development policies. This is a near universal issue that was raised repeatedly across our Pericles case regions in interviews on this subject. Uh, finally, adaptive reuse, we discussed that with um, heritage professionals and it received mixed reviews as they saw both positive and negative aspects to it, but said that while they were not always um, content with the way in which the heritage was being reused or any new interpretations of it, most crucially it can save neglected buildings and that was the key point that they, all, they saw in it and therefore were supportive of it. And this is just an example of some repurposed heritage. Um, that was originally a miners barracks and has been repurposed twice, um, originally a student accommodation. I actually stayed in that very barrack in, when I went to Svalbard as a student in 2014, and it's now a hotel. The building as, it as still serves a purpose, it is maintained, and in that way the tangible heritage is preserved. The inside of the building incidentally is now decorated with um, photographs of miners at work and information and about the area's mining history, so they're really helping keep the mining heritage going there in that way as well. Another aspect of the uh, social research that I did when I was up in Longyearbyen was mining cultural heritage resident survey. And it was a poll that was put out to residents with um, about five or six questions on it, asking their feelings, thoughts and feelings on the mining heritage in Svalbard and its development. And there were two key areas that I could tease out from that that I think were really relevant to um, a discussion that we're having today on Longer Beans Cultural Heritage. The first was on the contribution to place identity. I asked to what extent do you think the coal mining heritage contributes to Longer Beans place identity? Absolutely none of the respondents opted for not at all. And it was undisputed among them that the heritage is indeed a component of the town's identity. Whether they wanted it developed or not, whether they wanted it visible or not, they accepted that it was a part of it. And the majority of those at 57% thought it contributed very much. Only 8% thought it was a little, so it's very much skewed in the direction of it being an important part. I then asked about developing it and I said, do you think that Arctic industrial heritage should be preserved or developed for residents or for tourists? And they also had the option of both. And 70% approved of it being developed for both. 19% of it, were of them were of the opinion that it should be for residents only and 11% that it should be not be developed for either. And I think that in a part that is reflective of this um, animosity towards um, tourism and, and, and the, this belief that tourists have kind of encroached on local life. Um, one who chose development for neither made a comment about getting littered with tourists here, implying that they didn't want actions that may encourage more. Um, another aspect of it may be uh, a des genuine desire for community heritage, for something to be held within the community that was for them relating to them to the town, rather than simply being developed for tourism. And that would be very interesting to explore further. So moving on from the conceptual side to the more scientific side of today's presentation, I'm going to present the Arctic Cultural Heritage Vulnerability Index. I'm not going to go into too much technical GIS detail about this due to time constraints and so as not to alienate a significant proportion of the audience who do not have a background in GIS. But if anyone is interested in more detail, please do get in touch and I can send you that. I'll show my email address at the end. 
Now, the ACHVI came about because I was finishing off a part-time master's degree in GIS while working on Pericles, and I had to write my master's thesis. If I hadn't been working on Pericles, it probably wouldn't have been focused on cultural heritage, although it almost certainly would have involved Svalbard. The purpose of it was to develop a vulnerability index that can be used to quantify the vulnerability of tangible Arctic cultural heritage. So that this could be used to inform management and help cultural heritage be integrated into wider environmental and risk planning. It incorporates both environmental and site condition data and is grounded in an existing theory and practice on vulnerability indices for cultural heritage, but created specifically for Arctic conditions and crucially flexible enough to account for local variation across the vast Arctic region. Due to the remoteness of the Arctic, much planning is conducted at a local scale. So the tool had to be practical and accessible for local planners and her heritage practitioners to apply, not simply GIS professionals. And I chose to demonstrate this in Longyearbyen and Svalbard. Looking at other vulnerability indices that were specifically made for cultural heritage, I could find no previous applications that addressed the unique circumstances of Arctic cultural heritage. However, I could use some influence from these models on the development of the ACHVI. For example, taking the stages of methodology um, that had been adapted and, and sorry, taking the stages of, of methodology by Farina et al and adapting these to my model, taking the criteria rating on a scale of one to five, including future conditions because the Arctic is changing rapidly and the cultural heritage preservation of the near future is also very important. The heritage asset condition include, was included in the model and also the use of buffer zones. So there was a clear influence of uh, past work on this so as to build upon that and not start completely from scratch. The methodology was of four stages. Uh, these were three analysis stages and then the final calculation. We had a hazard analysis to identify threats an exposure analysis to determine exposure. The susceptibility analysis was based on the structure and condition of the asset, and that was to assess how susceptible it would be to damage from any of these hazards they were exposed to. And as I said, finally, the calculation itself. The data used was a mix of secondary and primary resources. Results were classified on a five point scale of very low vulnerability to very high vulnerability, and the results at the end were mapped. For the hazard analysis, threats were identified by literature review, and these were based on environmental data. Not all hazards apply in equal measures across the Arctic. It was therefore necessary to, to identify those that are relevant for the exposure analysis and to weight them as a reflection of their contribution to environmental risk to heritage, specifically in longer being. So for example, in some areas of the Arctic, avalanches are very high risk to cultural heritage and um, sea level rise might not be, and it could be the opposite in other areas. The ACHVI is a flexible tool, and it can be model modified for these varying conditions in different areas of the Arctic, simply by adjusting the included factors and their weightings. So what do we mean when we talk about threats to cultural heritage? And we've done a lot of work in this in Pericles as well. Where we define threats to cultural heritage may be defined as events or phenomena that could result in damage or irrecoverable loss. These threats, they can emerge from sudden loss uh, due to a catastrophic event such as an avalanche, or it could be gradual de deterioration from cumulative processes such as weathering. As the damage is often irreversible, it has broader economic, political, cultural and social effects beyond the heritage asset itself. So for this, a vulnerability index, it was focused on physical threats because it was on tangible heritage. And these can be, for example, meteorological, hydrological, geological, biological, astrophysical, human induced, or the result of climate change, which could impact upon any of these previous categories. It's worth noting, however, that intangible heritage can also be threatened, for example, through loss of traditions and skills, through changing working practices or loss of trades. And that's also an important part of cultural heritage threats, even though it would not be covered in the ACHVI. Those threats that are feeding into the hazard analysis then 
for the Arctic. They have coastal, coastal vulnerability to erosion. And the Arctic, this is highly variable. In some areas, there is none or almost none, and it can be up to 8.4 meters. In Svalbard, it's generally very low, although there are some areas that have been found to be more vulnerable. Then there's sea level rise, storm surge, and flooding. So that's your water hazards. Sea level rise affects some locations in the Arctic, but not Svalbard as the land continues to rise. Storm surge and flooding are expected to be exacerbated in most areas due to climate change. Increased freeze thaw cycles and thawing of the permafrost from rising temperatures is another factor that's already affecting cultural heritage in the Arctic, including in Svalbard. Avalanches common across mountain Arctic areas, these regularly affect longer being it's surrounded on three sides by mountains. Again, because of the mountainous topography, debris from landslides affect longer being particularly bad in the summer. And it's a significant hazard in many areas of the Arctic. These will only increase with climate change. Air pollution, it can degrade heritage materials in heavily industrialized or populated areas, but it will not significantly affect cultural heritage assets in Svalbard at present. Human impacts from use and development. This can be from industrial expansion in the Arctic, which leads to more infrastructure and more people. Uh, tourism is currently the major direct human stressor in Svalbard and Longyearbyen. Weathering, we have slow degradation of heritage fabrics as a natural process, but the rate of weathering will increase with climate change. So out of that list of eight, five different environmental criteria with the potential to impact heritage in Longyearbyen were incorporated in the model. Weights were allocated by uh, ROC ranking method, and that was simply to avoid me having to decide upon the weights myself when I wasn't an expert in these scientific aspects. Um, an ideal way to have weighted these factors would be to have had a panel of experts decide them, but that was not possible within the, the confines of this piece of work. So I used the surrogate weights as a, a means to re reduce the workload and me to only bring it down to um, a, a, an order. And you can see the order that these environmental criteria have there um, listed in bold. As I mentioned briefly before, the near future predictions are also considered in this model. And I took that to be around the next 20 to 30 years. And that was taken into account when deciding the ranking of them as well. So the, the hazard analysis was done. The second step was an exposure analysis. This included the zoning for each hazard on the scale of one to five. Secondary data was available and used for four hazards, avalanches, landslides and debris, coastal vulnerability and storm surge flood. The literature was reviewed to um, produce these zones and it was from peer reviewed research and official data only. And the most representative data that was available was selected for use. Wherever possible, this was data that had resulted from recent local scale field work. But primary data from my own field work was used for one hazard, and that was to calculate human impacts because there wasn't um, sufficient data available in the literature review for that. So I had realized that in order for this model to be demonstrated effectively in Longyearbyen, I really had to go back to Svalbard and do some work on the ground. Not that I generally need much convincing to go back to Svalbard. But um, in my time there, I did this work, I managed to map 67 heritage assets. Um, this was recording the heritage assets that had been uh, identified by desk analysis, took details of their physical condition, their structure, um, and the human impacts that affected them. The human impacts were assessed as a function of pressure and consequences for the heritage asset. So um, these ranged from insignificant consequences to severe, and very low to very high pressures. And it used this land use matrix to derive these scores. And the scores were then categorized to fit the standard one to five scale that I'd been applying throughout the model so far. Where the ACHVI to be applied over a larger geographical area, vulnerability to human threats could involve assessment of recent tourism data on cruise ship landings and possibly also land traffic such as snowmobile access. The resilience of the asset to the hazards that it faces determines the damage that was done, and that's why the susceptibility analysis was an important component. 
The current state and condition of the heritage assets were based on rapid visual inspection. Again, it would have been ideal to have had expert involvement in this, but because of the constraints, I had to use a simplified um, process that I derived myself by assignment of values in a five level rating scale. Uh, this was to quantify the data so that it could easily be integrated into, into the model. So it ranged in structural condition to no sign to potential collapse and the fabric condition very good down to very poor. With all of these analysis complete, it was finally time to calculate the Arctic Culture Heritage Vulnerability Index. And this was calculated by summation of the weighted criteria that you saw on the list several slides back. The calculated values for the 67 heritage ident assets identified ranged from 0.66 through to 3.58. So there was a wide range of values. And these were classified according to equal interval breaks into five vulnerability classes, ranging from very low through to very high. And this is the values mapped. The highest values, if you're familiar with Svalbard's, uh, with Longyearbyen's topography, you'll have noticed that the highest values are um, located in the avalanche and landslide risk areas. And if you're familiar with the heritage structures, you may also see that, uh, or have worked out that they're predominantly those that are not still in use, maybe have fallen into disrepair, maybe of wooden construction. This means that many of Longyearbyen's most vulnerable heritage assets are original structures that are connected with its mining past. Looking at the limitations for this model. The data available for, was available for Longyearbyen, but I'm very much aware that in other areas of the Arctic, data availability can be quite sparse, um, particularly for um, Greenland, for example, I've done some work there before. I know that data availability in Greenland is very sparse. There will also be additional factors, despite the amount of data that's available for Longyearbyen, that are still unknown or for which there is no data or could not be included in the model. And this might include wildlife damage. The weighting of the data, as I discussed previously, is very challenging. Um, and that's why the ROC method was chosen. But even with a panel of experts, there would be no guarantee that there would reach consensus. So the weighting of the data can be problematic. The final point relates to how vulnerable indis vulnerability indices are a bit of a double-edged sword. They are potentially oversimplifying a complex matter with a lot of uncertainty. However, it's important to bear in mind that the mere the main point of a vulnerability index is to bring together a lot of different information simply and accessibly. It is by nature supposed to be reductive to combine and distill all that information in a way that can guide policy and action. But it is nevertheless a limitation of them so that both aspects have to be borne in mind. Now that you've identified your threats, um, you might be looking to what can be done to address them. And some points that have come up in this through work in Pericles and through interviews in Longyearbyen was that there is a strong interplay between natural and cultural heritage, especially in vulnerable landscapes and between tangible and intangible cultural heritage. So when addressing threats, it's important to take a more holistic approach. Simply monitoring cultural heritage sites will have little effect beyond helping to understand the problem. There may be stronger evidence that better, this evidence and better translation of the research could be useful to promote awareness, but they're still not actually taking the action that needs to be accompanied in order to assist the preservation of the heritage and address these threats. Risk management is really what needs to be brought into play in these circumstances, and that's the implementation of decisions regarding the acceptance and control of risk. It entails considering all risks relative to each other to prioritize action and resources. And that's where something like a vulnerability index can come into play because it compares in a simplified form all the risks and susceptibilities. So at one quick look, you can prioritize actions and resources. But it not only involves mitigation and preservation strategies for heritage, risk management also involves building the capacity for government professionals and stakeholders in monitoring and implementing risk reduction and response efforts. And in the Pericles project, 
we are currently demonstrating and testing the Pericles participatory risk assessment framework that will bring together uh, policymakers, professionals and stakeholders uh, to work in development of risk management strategies. And if you want to follow the project, you will receive further news on this as when it's been tested and refined and finally published. And now that we've um, looked at the tangible heritage threats and, and addressing the threats to that heritage, although the ACHVI didn't cover intangible heritage, I would just like to um, look very briefly at what we can do um, with conservation of it. And conservation of intangible heritage can be quite complicated, more complicated even than tangible heritage. It's often held within individuals and communities, and this can make it invisible. It's complicated further in Svalbard by the more transient population with the uninherited heritage. We really need a better understanding of the dynamics of heritage, both in general and in Longyearbyen and Svalbard in specific. There are also widely common issues regarding the definition and sharing of heritage. Again, further complicated in Longyearbyen by demographic circumstances, but nonetheless, these are not a barrier to strong and tangible heritage conservation within a community when communities of meaning and participation are suitably mobilized. So some concluding thoughts on heritage in the Arctic. The Arctic is rich and unique natural and cultural heritage. Socially and environmentally, it has changed considerably over recent decades and continues to change at pace, which is why action on conserving the cultural heritage is very much urgent. The heritage in the Arctic faces many of the same, but also some regionally and locally specific issues. And it requires engagement with wider debates, but also a nuanced approach tailored to the local conditions and setting. There is a clear commitment to heritage in Svalbard. However, it faces a double disjoint, disjoint in perspectives, the image of the uninhabited place and the uninherited heritage. It's important to preserve intangible mining heritage at risk of imminent loss with the decline in, injury, in, in industry. Sorry. And it's important to listen to local people to include their perspectives on the response to changes and to develop heritage that represents and benefits the local community or communities to counter the commercialization of heritage. I mentioned them at the beginning and I'd just like to draw your attention to the Svalbard Social Science Initiative of whom I'm a member. We are an association of social science, humanities and arts-based researchers. We're working with a wide range of issues and projects in Svalbard, not just academic, but um, also many social community projects and arts projects. The aim of the network is to create linkages among social scientists working with issues related to Svalbard, to establish a platform co for coordinating research activities and to facilitate the communication with local communities and other scientists. For the latest news from the SSSI, for information on about our members and the projects that we're working on, and for details on how to join, please visit the website that you see on the screen there. So thank you very much for listening. As I promised, there is my email address if you want to get into contact. You will get me on that address until the end of April 2021. You can also find me on Twitter. So Matt, I'll hand back to you if you're ready, if you've got any questions. Thank you very much. Well, that was great. And yes, we do have lots of questions. And if there are any more questions, please feel free to get in the Q&A section. So I'm just going to start at the top. Um, and this is this is a long question. I'm going to try and <laughs> try and say, um, it is to which extent do you feel that the translation of knowledge and taking action has been successful in Longyearbyen, also related directly to your project? So lots of research is happening, but how much of it is taken into consideration by authorities and how much is beneficial locally? That's actually something that I'm not entirely sure of. I know that the majority of the research that's been conducted in Svalbard is scientific rather than social, but there is a very strong body of social research being conducted. Um, there is good connection, for example, between the SSSI and the local authorities in Svalbard. And um, some of our research has been translated up to them. We did um, a public uh, consultation on the new proposals for the management of central Spitsbergen. 
um, that was taken uh, into consideration by the local authorities, but how much of the research overall, not just including what I've been working on, has been considered as something that I, I don't really know the answer to. Yeah. And are there any, any barriers that you're aware of to this translation of knowledge and taking action? Um, it's, it's mainly finding the route in to the right people, which is a universal issue, no matter where you are in, in the world, it's getting your research to the policymakers. Um, one of the barriers is translating it into a, a language and a format which the, is accessible for them. Therefore, you, you have to have it in a, a much shorter format and an easier to digest language because the people who make these decisions don't have the time uh, to pour over lengthy papers. That's one barrier. And another barrier is simply being able to talk to them. Um, and uh, I, I do know, for example, that the, the local administrations forward are very easy to get into contact with. Yeah. Okay, the questions are jumping up and down, which is, is great. Um, <laughs> the next one I've got here is that mining seems to be quite a masculine heritage. Are there any interesting gender dimensions to cultural heritage in Svalbard? Um, what role have women played and how visible is it? There are, um, although it's not an area I've actually looked into myself, but there were women living up there and they lived in a separate barracks, and I understand that. But um, it's not an area I have focused on, although it's certainly one that could be because I know that that heritage is there. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, this is a bit more of a practical one. Um, how many people have participated in the Mining Heritage Residence Survey? I can't remember off the top of my head, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It was done last year and I do have it written down, but I would have to go, go out and find out how many it was. It was less than 100, I know that, but it was more than 50. It was, I'm sorry, it's not a very general answer. <laughs> Maybe we can find a more precise answer. Um, <laughs> I, could, I could definitely get you the exact answer and get back to you with it. Okay, Look, we'll, um, we'll put that one on the back burner. But yes, thank you. Okay, the next one is, there's two parts to this one. So do you have any lessons from your experience developing the Arctic Cultural Heritage Index that could be useful for or applicable in other contexts? And then a follow-up is, is how your work could scale, for example, sub-Antarctic islands? Um, okay, so answer, can I answer the questions one at a time? What was the first yes. one? <laughs> the first one is, lesson, do you have any lessons from your experience lessons. developing the article of Cultural Heritage Index? Yes. Uh, especially if it's applicable in other contexts. Yes, when you're doing field work, allow for more time than you think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first lesson. Um, and the second is to look ahead when you're, if you're developing it and you're a very short time frame, uh, look ahead to the availability of the information that you have and try to develop your index around the available information. And another lesson is to pay particular attention to what gaps there are because the gaps are important. And if you can in any way contact someone who might be able to fill those gaps, um, that, that's an important lesson as well. Okay, do. yes. And then the follow-up to that question, from Damon is that he is very interested in how your work could scale to, for example, subantarctic islands with relation to whaling heritage. Yes, well, for, for scaling it up, you would you would first of all be looking at the, scale, the scaling up of the data. So you'd be looking at the size of the area and you'd be looking at less specific elements. And when it comes to the, the biggest issue of scale would be the field work because, rather than the, the data, environmental data, because that, that's very easy to change in scale. For the um, human impacts data, as I mentioned in the slides, you could also take that from existing data, for example, and on cruise ship landings, again, that would be um, applicable in that part of the world, or for any whatever forms of human use are in that part of the Arctic, whether it's industrial development or whatever, that could be available from literature. So the main challenge then would be if you were incorporating the structure or the condition, and if you couldn't get around the large area yourself and if that information wasn't available from previous studies you may be forced um, not to include that but perhaps to include something else in the model. Something that was in my model I would actually love to have included is heritage values but that would have involved um, include involving professionals or communities but that would have been a great, uh, great way to have added more depth to it uh, yeah. uh, particularly if the information on the structure and the fabric was unavailable. But in, in scaling up, the key thing is to work with the data that you've got. Great. Fantastic. 
All right, we've got a strongly upvoted question from Sam, which has risen to the top of the charts. And um. <laughs> <laughs> what are the perceived or already experienced benefits to quantifying vulnerability? I'm sorry, I lost your, any... I've just lost your sound there for a second. Could you repeat um, that? I can indeed repeat that. What are the perceived or already experienced benefits to quantifying vulnerability? Is there any integration with the place, identity and community participatory work? Uh, in terms of, um, I'll first of all answer the second part because that's a quicker answer. <laughs> the um, integrating it with, commu with communities, that would be for the, the, the values-based research I discussed there, which would be through either heritage professionals or by preference through community participation. And that would bring the community's views in and you would weight them along with other criteria and um, the, the development or, or the preservation of heritage would then include those views. Um, for the first part, sorry, could you repeat the first part of the question? Of course, yes. What are the perceived or already perceived. experienced benefits yes. to quantifying vulnerability? The perceived um, benefits or, or the already realised benefits are that it provides a rapid and easily accessible source of information. It allows you to compare across um, heritage assets or, or in anything if you're doing vulnerability, vulnerability indices that would be difficult to compare if you were to look at them all as descriptions on paper or even all as photographs. It takes a large amount of information using lots of different factors and it distills it and that into a number. And then you can base your actions reflected on the urgency or the value and that that's the main benefit of these indices of quantifying it. Great, yes, fantastic. And then we've got a bit of a, a technical question here from Brian is, and it is the, um, is future planning and development in Svalbard controlled by standard Norwegian government procedures or are there special limitations? There is local governance in Svalbard. Um, it is a democracy, so that they, would be subject to those rules, but I'm not sure to what extent the Norwegian planning rules are in play there. It, that's not really a little bit out with my field. Yes, look, that's completely fair enough. <laughs> And then we have a question from Dinah, which is that, can you share a map or table of the 67 sites specifically, which they are? I can, I can't show you it just now on the laptop. Um, I showed it in the little map on the slide, but I can get the, I can get the map to Dinah if she wants it. Yes, okay. Well, that was actually the end of the list of questions, but if anyone has, um, anything they would have a burning desire to ask then jump in, in now and we can do that. Um, otherwise, I suppose that, that would be it for today. Just wait a couple of, couple of seconds to see if anyone jumps in. Potentially. When you're I just, out of personal interest here as well, um, are there anywhere, I mean, Svalbard's quite a unique place. Are there any parallels that you can see in other places that you're aware of or, or any any kind of, <laughs> any links there with other places? Uh, well, the, the obvious links with Norway and Russia because there are populations from there. Um, there are also a lot of, Svalbard is very international um, it's been exploited by many nations, including the Dutch, the, the British, they've, they've been, for, for various reasons for, for mining, particularly those two. Um, so there are these traces there, but in, looking at it in terms of the culture, more modern culture, very closely linked with Norway and, and other Arctic regions because they face the same kind of lifestyle and climate. Yes, great. And we, we have had another question, so that was worth waiting for. <laughs> Um, how do you see the recent hiatus of tourism from COVID affecting cultural heritage conservation in Longyearbyen? Well, I know from doing some reading of research that's been conducted on the condition of cultural heritage that tourism does impact it. And um, with the cruise ships landing, lots of people getting off and walking around the areas, um, damaging the environment around about the asset, that there has been damage done. So uh, one would hope that there would be some sort of relief from that and the environment would have a bit of time to heal. But uh, I don't think the researchers are even able to get up there to discover that this year. It was something that will 
have to wait for next year. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I think that was that was that. We had lots of comments in the chat saying very interesting work, and thank you very much, Laura. So I would like to second that because yes, thank you. It was indeed very interesting. <laughs> and otherwise. I guess we'll say goodbye for now and remember to check the social media for further updates about further events. Is that okay? Great. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Au revoir. <laughs>